Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for making time out of your day to join us to talk to some incredible young people about the amazing work that they've been doing. My name is Rainsford Stoffer. I am a freelance writer, and I am so honored to be in conversation with so many incredible people today. And how I was hoping we could start is that each of you could go around, we can introduce ourselves, share a little bit about your work, and in particular, your work this year during what's been such a consequential time for so many different intersecting issues. I guess I can go first. Um, hi everyone, my name is Luz, my pronouns are she or her Aya, and I'm a youth organizer for United We Dream. Uh, given this time, uh, you know, mobilizing and organizing the streets was a little harder uh, for a lot of people that were in, in the movement. Um, so a lot of things went virtual. Uh, given that and everything that was happening within our community with COVID-19, uh, you know, some of the work that I've been doing was definitely um, organizing some high schools that I work with on, you know, collecting groceries, uh, fresh produce, and, and a lot of like um, essential things needed for, for, to combat this virus. So um, we organized with all the high schoolers in my, in my uh, chapters, organized uh, these food drop-offs, uh, produce drop-offs to a lot of families that were undocumented in our area uh, because we know how much this virus has really directly impacted us and we were able to give back during this time and while old organizing online. <laughs> Yeah, first of all, it's great to be here with all of you and it's nice to um, hear from all of you. Uh, I have, I'm a climate activist and I first got involved in the climate movement after I started striking every Friday in front of the United Nations headquarters in New York City. And so I started striking on December 14th of 2018 and I ended up striking every Friday for over a year, which, um, and so I, it ended up getting up until March though before the pandemic started and that's when a lot of our activism started to move online. And so since then, just a little bit about what's happened, we've been working with other activists a lot to keep online activism going like digital strikes. And there's been a lot of activism as well from the climate movement on TikTok. And so we're using basically every social media platform we have um, to push our movement even forward. And so we've been building as well a lot of our relationships and recruiting and training new people. And especially in my organization, Earth Uprising, we've been bringing in a lot more young people who want to get involved. And so what the one thing that I'm very excited and looking forward to is what Earth Uprising, we've been designing a schooled program where we actually teach young people peer to peer to educate them about the climate crisis and then through that mobilize them to take direct action. And so this year has been a lot of learning and next year I hope is the year for even more action. Hi, uh, uh, it's so great to be here. I'm so excited to hear from all of my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm Samir, I'm fine with any pronouns. Um, and I founded a nonprofit called the Empathy Alliance um, whose goal is to make schools safer and more inclusive for LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and so a lot of our work uh, normally is, you know, talking to educators, speaking on panels at conferences, uh, working with schools one-on-one, -on -one, um, even, you know, earlier this year before the pandemic, going to DC and lobbying legislators for uh, more inclusive legislation. But of course, uh, when the pandemic hit, a lot of that was no longer possible. Uh, and additionally, just the way school worked was completely different from how you know, normally in-person uh, classes are. And so I found that a lot of my work was shifting now to um, the home environment and community environments because now uh, students are at home 24 seven. Uh, and so it was more important than ever that not only um, are, are their school environments safe and inclusive, but that they have you know, safety at home as well, because this pandemic has been especially rough for LGBTQ plus youth um, who, who might be in really tough situations with families who don't support who they are, but they have no other choice uh, but to live with them. Uh, and so, so a lot of my work has now shifted 
to spreading awareness uh, and, and making sure, especially in my own South Asian community, that uh, is not always the most uh, accepting of, of LGBTQ plus identities, that, um, that we understand how important it is, especially now, to take care of our LGBTQ plus youth. Hi, my name is Sade. I use she, her pronouns. I just wanna say thank you for inviting me and it's an honor to be here alongside amazing activists. Um, a large part of my activism started around racial representation and decision-making power of people of color in politics. And it started before 2017, but in 2017, I interned for the United States Congress. And it was an honor to be you know, alongside members of Congress and fight for social justice and really get a behind the scenes look at government However, it was disheartening to see the lack of racial diversity. And it was something that I knew would happen. I wasn't really surprised, but it's very different when you're actually in these rooms and you walk into these hearings and these briefings and these intern lectures, and then you're physically like the only you know, black person there, or you're, there's only a couple people of color there. And so after I came back from Congress, I was like, you know what, I definitely want to help expand the political pipeline so that young people of color are in these rooms because there is a pipeline. When you're, you know, people who become interns become legislative staff, then they become politicians. And so it's really just a direct pipeline. I didn't see anyone who looked like me. Well, I did see people who looked like me, but not a lot. And so that's what my activism was focused on. So after um, I came back from Congress, I gave a TEDx talk, I wrote a couple of op-eds, particularly one for Forbes that was called How the Political Pipeline Disenfranchises Young People of Color. I organized a summit at Harvard Law School um, in order to expand the political pipeline. So there's a couple of things that I've done to, um, you know, dismantle what the pipeline is right now. And, you know, this year, the pandemic hasn't changed my activism too much. You know, it has changed the in-person you know, conferences and summits because we're trying to stay safe. But, you know, writing has always been a part of my activism. And so and I've been a writer since I was a kid. And so writing op-eds and poems um, has just come naturally to me. And it's something I've been doing even in the pandemic. And yeah, writing is an activist tool for me, so. This is brilliant. I'm so excited to ask each of you a little more individualized question about your work. So um, everybody watching online or watching later can get a sense of the issues that you're fighting for and the incredible work you're doing in various arenas. Um, but before we head in that direction, I did want to ask the group a more general question that's kind of been on my mind lately. I wanted to ask about the necessity of young people in leadership which I think you're each obviously uniquely positioned to speak to. Representation is obviously critical, but I wondered what, in your opinion, makes young people uniquely positioned to be leaders right now? I can go ahead. Um, so, I think uh, for me, one of the main things that uh, kind of propelled me to get into activism and to start talking about um, the issue of, of um, LGBTQ plus inclusivity in schools was because I had faced uh, bullying all throughout elementary and middle school for um, you know being feminine, for liking things like theater and um, the color pink and just like, you know, silly stuff like that, that definitely should not be the cause of bullying. But unfortunately, I grew up in a place where like any deviation from the norm was um, seen as a reason to target. And, um, and the interesting thing was that a lot of the language that was used to bully me was stuff that my teachers may not have even known was problematic. At least they didn't uh, call it out, even though our school you know, had very explicit anti-bullying policies. And I think part of the reason was because um, language and culture shifts so dramatically from generation to generation. And so the things that may have been, you know, homophobic language for my teacher's generation is not the same things that were used to bully me in, in my generation. And so part of the education that I do is to update uh, teachers who may not be very well aware of, of stuff like that on what you know our generation faces and what the the unique problems of you know social media and, and other things that you know they might not have had to deal with uh, play a role in in um, causing harm to LGBTQ plus youth and so that stuff you know has to come from youth that stuff has to come from the people who are experiencing it and I think we are you know uniquely positioned 
um, to be able to fight back against it and, and to have the tools to fight back against it. That being said, it is much harder when you're going through it, when you're, you know, being affected by these issues to then also have to stand up and, um, and, and make a change and teach other people and, you know, take that leadership role. I think it, it is, you know, a lot to put on youth. And I, and I don't think that, you know, it's necessarily a good thing that I had to, you know, at 14 years old, uh, stand up uh, for who I was and, and train teachers and, you know, try to get inclusive curriculum in schools. Like that was a lot to put on me as, as a young kid. But, you know, if, if I didn't do it, no one else would have. Um, and so for me, I think that it, it's really, it really just boils down to if we don't do it, you know, no one else will. We are the ones who have to make the change. And it's not necessarily fair, but it is empowering. And it definitely, um, it gave me a lot of, of, of joy and it gave me a lot of um, happiness to see that I could make that change. Uh, and so even though, you know, I might not uh, think that, you know, we, we should try to, you know, put this burden on youth, uh, anyone who's willing to stand up for and, and and try to make that change, it can be incredibly empowering uh, to know that you are the person who can make a difference and that you did something to make a difference. Amazing. Alexandria, do you want to go next? Yeah, you know, kind of going off of that, I feel like it's the same for in the climate movement. Young people are affected the most by the climate crisis, and so that's why they're getting involved. So we have the most at stake in this. And so we understand the urgency more than some older generations. I always tell people that youth activists were basically the moral and the conscious voice of our politicians. And so every aspect of our lives will be affected by climate change, where we go to school, where we live. Um, a lot of young people are even having conversations about whether or not they want to have children. And so I've actually just only started high school. I'm in the ninth grade. And so there's still so much more of my life ahead of me. And so in my lifetime, though, I will see the death of coral reefs and no sea ice in the Arctic. And those things are scary because they'll affect our weather systems and we'll have more severe weather events that we'll have to survive and get through. And so young people, we see the climate crisis. And so we come into this movement because a lot of us are angry and we want to do something. And so when we start to get involved and organize, we tend to think outside of the box because we haven't really been inside this current system of solutions. And so that's why our solutions are sometimes more creative and more innovative. Definitely. And Sade, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I just want to echo um, what was said. Like, it was great. The only thing I have to add is the fact that, um, you know, if you're looking at the political pipeline, it's like young people are uniquely positioned because we're the ones who are just coming into that pipeline. And so there are a lot of like, um, you know, senators and representatives who are already there. And not only are they only not, not only are they already there, but they also don't look like, you know, they're not a lot, they're not, a lot of them are a lot of people of color. And so they don't look like me. And so you know, oftentimes it's just like the status quo, the status quo, it is what it is. But we need people who are different, who are not currently in that establishment, who are just coming in to make the difference. And oftentimes those are young people. And so that's why young people are uniquely positioned um, because they're really oftentimes on the outside looking in and like, it's kind of like a breath of fresh air. Absolutely. And Luz, do you wanna close us off for this question? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we need young people because we bring bold ideas. Uh, we bring fresh ideas and passion and courage to these spaces. And a lot of times um, we're the ones with the solutions because all of us are directly impacted uh, from a lot of things that are happening around the world. So I definitely see that in immigrant rights spaces and, you know, the victory of many, uh, many legislations that we were able to get pushed through but that was because of the work of young people in our, in our movement. Absolutely, thank you all for giving such thoughtful feedback and thoughtful responses to that question. I'm excited to keep going with this conversation. And to that end, Sade, I wanted to ask you about a tremendous op-ed you wrote where there was one line that, that had really stayed with me, whether it was a hearing, briefing, or intern lecture, I continually walked into rooms where white interns dramatically outnumbered black interns and other 
color. And so I wanted to ask you, and I know you've alluded to this already, but what does dismantling this political pipeline look like, especially when it comes to putting young people of color into leadership roles and letting them create policy? Well, thank you. Um, the first thing I would say is access, because you know when you look at when you look at who is entering on the hill and why they're entering on the hill. So if you look at like I, I would say the first thing is like paid work opportunities, you know, um, and I'm not just talking about internships. I'm talking about like campaigns. I'm talking about, um, you know, even part time staff, because when I was on the hill, I'll speak from my experience. Um, when I was on the hill, you know, I got a stipend for my college, which was great, you know, but not all colleges do that. And so there are a lot of students who have to um, decide between like a Metro pass or groceries or, you know, an outfit for every day, like wearing just for like Congress or um, my rent, you know, like there's decisions that a lot of you have to make and we shouldn't be making those decisions. Like it's not, it's not our burden and it's not fair. And that shouldn't have to be the deciding factor between, you know, being civically engaged and like surviving. And so you often look at who is a, who has those resources and who is a lot, who is able to pay rent and afford groceries and get all these nice outfits for hearings. It's, it's white, white, young white people. And it's, um, especially wealthy white people. And so, and it's not to any fault of like black and uh, black people, and young people of color. It really is just about generational wealth, institutional racism, you know, the resources that we have been, you know, denied and, and things that have been stolen from us. So when you already have that disadvantage and then you have, you know, a political system, then you're seeing the same types of people who can afford to be on the hill and who can afford to work without, you know, it being a burden. They're the ones who go through that pipeline. So access is the first thing, like paid work opportunities. I would say the second thing is an anti-racist hiring process, and it has to be actively anti-racist. And by that, I mean, like, for example, changing the requirements um, for internships. You know, I think that, well, I know that there's like a certain type of person that a lot of offices are looking for, like you, you know, just a certain type of school and um, a certain type of work experience. Did you enter, did you intern at Senator Senator so-and-so's office, or did you go to Harvard or whatever? And it's like, you know, you don't have to have those qualifications to want to make a difference or to be qualified. There are so many qualified um, young Black people, young people of color who are passionate about change and who are brilliant and, and capable and want to make a difference. And one of the reasons why they're not in that pipeline is because, you know, the qualifications and not to say they're not qualified, but it's the idea of like, what, what, is, what is qualified, you know? And to even be qualified for those positions, you have to have other qualifications. And so it's just really a cycle of being barred from one thing, you know, to the next. So if you're not having like this internship um, and, and you need that to be in Congress or that's what they're looking for, I mean, it's really just like, you know, like I said, like a cycle. Um, so I, I would love to see, um, I, I think it's, I know it's rooted in a lot like of white supremacy and um, elitism and classism. I would like to see that like just completely dismantled. Uh, I would like to see activists and organizers um, who have PhDs and who don't, you know what I'm saying? Like that, you know, who have masters and who, who, who don't because I would like to see Congress really understand that lived experiences our qualifications, you know, like what it's like to be a black person, you know, um, fighting for, for, you know, fighting for your life on the streets. Like that's, that to me, it's like, you, you already know what's going on. You don't need a master's to do that, you know? Um, and all these degrees and all these qualifications aren't necessarily what make people qualified to serve. And so I would like to see really just like kind of us reimagine what it means to be qualified um, and, and to start paying people because that's important. I wish we could broadcast that answer literally everywhere. Lived experiences are qualifications. Absolutely. I, it just bears repeating over and over. And, and speaking of the value of lived experiences, um, Samir, I want to go over to you, um, and especially with so much happening right now with a potential new Department of Education, this being a very tumultuous year for education in general, I wanted to ask what issues are top of your mind right now in work regarding creating more inclusive school climates? Yeah, so I mean, in general, the past couple of years have been extremely tumultuous in terms of education. And I think um, since we don't really have um, federal protections uh, on things like uh, gender identity and sexual orientation, um, it's really up to whoever uh, is in charge at the moment to decide the fate of, um, of 
of hundreds of thousands of LGBTQ plus students. And that's incredibly scary. Uh, you know, the Obama administration um, had some executive orders that were really beneficial to uh, trans students and then Trump took office and took those away. And just like that, you know, the rights of, of students in schools were gone, uh, completely erased. Um, and, and, you know, we're working to, and, and hopefully with this uh, new presidency, we can get some of those back. But, but uh, I would really like to see those protections uh, become law. So they can't be taken away. They can't just um, be dropped. Um, and on top of that, um, any of these protections, uh, for the most part, only apply to schools receiving federal funding. So private schools and religious schools that don't take federal funding are exempt and they can discriminate based on gender identity or sexual orientation, uh, which means that, say, if you're a teacher at a Catholic school and you come out as gay, you can be fired. Um, or if you are a student at a Catholic school that you know, requires any kind of uh, admission, you can, you can be um, expelled just for your sexual orientation. I mean, that, that should be illegal. Um, and then again, as I mentioned before, with this pandemic uh, and, and you know, depending on how things go, it's, it's more important than ever um, that uh, this activism is taken to you know, not just schools, but to communities and to uh, families. Um, you know, I, I was very lucky that I had a supportive family, um, but you know, n there are so many LGBTQ plus youth that are kicked out of their home for being who they are, that have to decide between their family and their sexual orientation or gender identity, or their faith, their community, um, and, and their sexual orientation and gender identity. And that's just not a choice that anyone should have to make. Um, and so by spreading awareness, by educating people on what you know, these identities mean, um, the history of, of the oppression uh, and the discrimination that these identities have faced, um, and, and just um, familiarizing people with you know, real queer people, I think a lot of people just, you know, don't really know queer people in their own lives. And so they have this, um, these assumptions and uh, these stereotypes about uh, LGBTQ plus people. And, and the biggest thing that I found is just when I am unapologetically myself uh, and I talk to people who, you know, might have these biases um, just by telling them, you know, look, I'm, I'm a person, you're talking to me, I'm a person, and this is just how I identify, that can break down a lot of barriers. So, you know, there are all these legal challenges, but I think also, you know, um, just societally, we need to educate and uh, create more awareness because no matter how many protections we put in place, if, you know, parents are still kicking their kids out or trying to convert uh, their, their kids uh, to a sexual orientation that is impossible <laughs> to convert to, then, um, you know, we will, we will never be able to fully have equality. This is so important and it brings up uh, one of the things that I admire so much about the work that each of you do, which is that it really does feel grounded in this idea of community and serving your community. Communities. And to that end, Luce, I also wanted to ask you about a piece you wrote, I think in September, where you described being introduced to the immigration movement by your older cousin. And one of the lines I loved from that was that DACA has shown us what happens when the people directly impacted are the ones putting forth the solutions. Um, I thought that was incredibly powerful. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why that's been such a pivotal example of organizing and kind of what's next in this work for you um, in regard to this idea of community. Absolutely. So, um, you know, a lot of times, at least when I entered the immigration rights movement, I was always told that DACA was a pivotal example of, of organizing, of youth organizing, right? Um, it was a victory, DACA was a victory that young people, uh, immigrant young people uh, came together and said, um, you know, we need permanent, we need, we need solutions for our community and we're not going to stop until we, we get an answer, right? And they pushed a sitting president who said nothing could be done, who was, who said that he had no power to do anything. And we saw firsthand how our community was always pushed to the side. Uh, young people weren't in the, in the tables uh, when talking about comprehensive immigration reform, right? So they, they, they took on a different route and they pushed a sitting president to pass temporary, um, temporary status for, for undocumented youth all over, the, 
all over the country. And, um, you know, it's, it, it delivered one of the biggest wins in 30 years in immigration um, policy. So it was really amazing to see how the power of young people pushed for, um, for a, a solution like DACA, right? And that wasn't it, like we, we, keep on, we keep on moving. And the reason why is because their movement is built by building new leaders. And for me, at least, that's what I see uh, myself in the future, you know, pushing for more, le more youth leaders like Andrea and Michelle, who are currently in high, in, in high school or starting college um, and impacting their own communities, right? And building that leadership pipeline uh, because we know firsthand how powerful youth are and with their new, um, you know, with, with a new understanding of how society works at that time. Absolutely, that's tremendous. And Alexandria, I wanna to go to you kind of staying on this thread. Um, according to some data from Circle, some of the top issues for young voters in this um, past election were the pandemic, racism, and climate change. And I wanted to ask you why intersectionality is so critical to climate justice work. Yeah, you know, that's a very important question. And I think that intersectionality is actually the most important part of addressing the climate crisis. See, not only is being intersectional the moral and right thing to do, but we must have representation in the decision making and solution spaces by the people who are the most affected by the climate crisis. And unfortunately, this usually is people of color, youth, and indigenous and low income communities. See, representation influences outcomes and solutions. And so without intersectionality, the solutions put into place are most likely wrong and don't have the effect they need to have. And so we can't win this fight without centering the narratives and needs of those communities being affected the most by climate change right now. And also, I think that when we work intersectional intersectionally, that's when a lot more related issues come into view. And so intersectionality shows us, um, shows us how labor issues, healthcare issues, and issues of equity are directly tied to the climate crisis, and they must be a part of these solutions. Absolutely. This has been tremendous, and I want to keep going, bringing it back to another question to the group, kind of staying on this idea of elections, um, because obviously young people voting, youth voter turnout was the subject of a lot of headlines, a lot of enthusiasm, but also obviously the work that you all are doing was clearly started far long before any single race and will continue long after any single presidency. And so kind of looking forward past 2020, maybe even past 2021, I wanted to ask how you're feeling about organizing and activism and your work and kind of what the future of this looks like. So Sade, do you want to start us off here? For sure. Um, you know, when the election was happening, people were like, you know, vote, vote, vote. And like, yes, voting is very important. But I think a lot of people were missing the fact that, you know, it's not just about voting. And so I was telling everyone, like, you cannot vote your way out of white supremacy. Like, there's just no way. You know, if we're going to truly liberate ourselves, we have to find ways to create change outside of these institutions. And so what does that look like? That looks like organizing protests and teach-ins. Um, that looks like educating ourselves and people in our communities. It looks like lobbying. It looks like volunteering at nonprofits and initiatives. Like there's so many ways to create change in our communities that don't involve voting, although voting is important. And so um, I just really want people, and that's something I always talk about with, with my peers and just, you know, anyone. Like I want people to understand that like change cannot just come from voting. Um, it can't just come from running from office. Like there's, there's many ways to participate in our democracy. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, and I think like my work is an example of that because I started activism in high school, even before high school, like middle school, um, you know, doing, you know, just volunteering. And then when I got to high school, I was a president of my key club where I did like organized food drives and helped my community. And so a lot of my activism actually didn't have anything to do with politics until I got to college. And I think that is a testament to the fact that you can create change without really um, being in these institutions and without being an elected official. Um, and so I, I want people to understand that there's really tangible ways to create 
to change without having to, you know, run for office without, you know, only relying on voting. I think that's such a necessary part of this conversation that feels like it has to be amplified over and over. Um, and Samir, I wanted to go to you to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, this this past election was my first time ever voting, and it was definitely an interesting experience for me because I started activism um, right around you know 2016. Um, and very much like influenced by a lot of the the uh, 2016 election and everything I was feeling about that. Um, and I think my my um, my view has kind of shifted a lot because I was just so angry in 2016, and I was like, you know, there was so much we were waiting for in 2020 to to change everything. But that's really not um, it's really not possible. It's something that I, I definitely realized this year was that you know, especially for presidential races, but pretty much every race. Um, voting will, will kind of always be a compromise. So I definitely don't agree with people who say, you know, we, we shouldn't vote until we find a perfect candidate because we're never going to have a perfect candidate. Um, but, you know, for the president, the president, you know, the president's job is in essence to represent America. And unfortunately, we live in a country in which a significant population um, doesn't believe that, you know, people of color should have equal rights doesn't believe that LGBTQ people should have equal rights. And so um, it, it's pretty much going to be impossible for, you know, any one president to believe everything uh, that we believe and to, you know, be as progressive as maybe we want them to be. Um, and so I really realized uh, that that so much depends on, you know, movements outside of the, the political sphere, outside of the elections um, in, you know, doing the community work, doing the work to dismantle these systems. Um, obviously, we want to try to do that in politics as well, but you can't just do that with politics. You have to also make sure, um, because politics is a reflection of the country, that we change the country, that we change the people, the hearts and minds of the people. Um, and, and I've even seen that work on, on a local level, um, where the, the education work that I've been doing in my local community um, to to make people more aware of LGBTQ plus rights and issues uh, and the ways in which LGBTQ plus youth are hurt uh, by a lot of you know the policies that we have in our cities and our schools um, that that led to um, movements and change uh, that eventually you know led to legislation being changed policies being changed because the people you know wanted it to be so and and really that's true for for any you know big landmark um, you know, political movement or political action, uh, it, it's because of the people, it's because of the will of the people. And so we need to, to really have that um, community support and community organizing in order to have any political change. Definitely. I think the community aspect is, again, a theme we just keep coming back to here. And, and so, Luz, I want to pull you in on this. Yeah, definitely. So, like, mobilizing voters and grounding on on voting, grounding our work on voting during this time was, was you know, a push to get Trump out. But again, that's not the end all be all. We still have his voters um, out there, especially now, like in in D.C. where where I live, like you know, proudly showing how, you know, regardless of who won the election, they're still going to be out there. And, you know, I, I can't even vote. I'm undocumented. And unfortunately, a lot of the policies that are put in place because of people that are voted into office, you know, they, they directly impact me and my family. And it impacts our, our sanity and, 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 you know, our, our feeling of, of being able to live here and, and being able to succeed here, right? And, you know, like, there's so many ways to get involved especially in the immigrant rights movement, a lot of our work isn't even during election periods. We, we, constantly, we constantly mobilize our folks to be out there uh, when someone, um, you know, when, when there's policies put in place in which that hurt our community, right? And, um, you know, like ending police collaboration with ICE, which is something that, you know, I was pushing towards in my local um, city where you know um folks that were uh undocumented didn't feel safe in their own community because the police was working with ice and 
you know, we, we pushed forth that change. We shared our story. And, you know, this wasn't even during an election time period. And a lot of people were pushing for the, the sanctuary cities, uh, uh, solutions for, for, for their community. And for me, it's like, we were able to, to win that. And like knowing that your, your, your activism, your involvement doesn't stop at an election. It, it continues on to push forth changes in your own community, locally, uh, statewide or nationally. So yeah. And like, um, you know, I always, I, I always tell my, my, my youth that like that, you know, it's, it doesn't stop here. We just got to keep on moving forward for more um, progressive and bold um, ideas. I think this is so important and, and it's a conversation that I think we saw a lot of in the lead up to the 2020 election, this idea that the work sometimes happens outside the election. Sometimes it has nothing to do with an election at all. It exists because it's necessary work. And Alexandria, I know you are also um, not eligible to vote or at least we're not in 2020. And so I wanted to pull you in for your thoughts on this to, to close us off. Definitely. Um, yeah, I sadly was not able to vote yet um, and in this election. But, you know, I first kind of want to start off with saying that after these past couple of years of organizing, one thing that I've learned is that as activists, we can be kind of called on to take all sorts of different kinds of action. And so for me, this year has, of course, been strongly focused on voting because we had a huge issue in our White House, um, especially for climate change. But we always have to be ready to pivot to the most urgent issues. And so right now we're watching how our political transition goes and we're getting ready to hold our new political leaders here in the United States accountable for the climate commitments they've already made. And so even going beyond this, we're already starting to plan for COP26 because once we've rejoined the Paris Agreement, that is the next level where we need urgent actions. And so we're preparing our demands and direct actions that will be taking place at Glasgow next November. Definitely. And I, I want to kind of stay on this idea of myths about young people as leaders, myths that we just need young people to turn out at the ballot box and whatever else happens is kind of like a bonus instead of fundamental to the movements and to the work. I wanted to ask you all about another common myth I hear a lot, um, including from a lot of politicians, that young people are quote unquote too young, too naive, too unqualified to actually be in positions of leadership, uh, which we know makes no sense because young people are leading all the time, even outside of a, of a political context. So Sade, I wanted to turn it over to you um, and ask what you would say to these people who kind of continue this trope of young people not belonging in the room. Well, <laughs> the first thing I would say <laughs> is, is that, um, you know, John Lewis, you know, um, Ruby Bridges, Claudette Colvin, Dr. King, they were all they were all young when they started creating change. And so we have examples of people who were young who are who have just completely changed the course of history. So that's just like the first thing. And especially like, you know, because I met John Lewis and had, you know, opportunity to talk to him and interview him. Um, one thing that I really admired about him was just that he was so young when he created change. And, you know, when I was talking to him, you know, I was, I was just, you know, starting college. I it was the summer after my freshman year. And so really be able to, for him to understand what it's like to be in a place, be young, but still be passionate. So I would just point them to people who've already done it. You know, that's the first thing. <laughs> um, but the second th thing, oftentimes the people who are saying this are the people who had the chance to do something and they didn't, you know, and it's like, you know, you have a chance to do about something about climate change and you didn't. Now we're left with it. You have the chance to do something about racial justice, healthcare, uh, queer rights, um, you know, education, but you didn't. So now we're doing it. And there is this burden on young people now to, um, to, to, to fix everything. And it's, it's it's really it's really odd because they'll say that we're not qualified, but then also they'll say like young people are the future. Like they'll romanticize our work and say we're the future, we're the future. And you know I also just don't like that either because um, it really 
takes away accountability from them, you know, like we shouldn't have to be doing this. Like, yes, okay, like, you know, environmental racism is something that like, you know, we're gonna have to deal with, but like, you could have done that, you know, and you didn't. So that's something that I think of. The first thing is to point them to people who've done it before, you know, just to repeat Dr. King, um, you know, John Lewis, Ruby Bridges, Claudette Calvin, and so many others. And then also to say like, hey, um, this was kind of your responsibility and now we're, we're dealing with it. And so it's kind of ironic that talking about not being qualified or not leading when we're, we're doing it now. <laughs> yeah, that dichotomy just kind of remains mind blowing. And Samir, I know you alluded to this, I think toward the introduction that this is actually it puts an incredible burden on young people. And so I want to pull you in here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as, as a lot of us talked about, it's like, we're kind of the only ones who, who can do it or who are willing to step up and, and do this work. Um, and so it, it's, it's really frustrating to then hear that, you know, we're not qualified or we're not good enough to be doing the work that we're already doing. Um, I, I think another, you know, kind of related, um, you know, something that I, that I hear a lot that's kind of like, you know, if, if you ask like, why, why aren't, why aren't young people um, ready or why aren't young people, you know, um, allowed to, to, be in leadership or to make change, something I hear a lot is like, oh, you know, young people don't understand the realities of the world or mm -hmm. or too idealistic. Like we want too much. You want racial justice and LGBTQ rights and climate, like you want all of it. It's like, yeah, 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 we do. And, and I think a lot of times um, people, older people, you know, they've had to learn these systems of, of oppression and they've internalized them because They've been in them for so long. Um, and uh, things that I hear from even people who, you know, want, you know, all of my rights, but they, they're like, okay, you have to learn to compromise. You have to, you know, that's how the world works. And I think the, the, the beauty of, of being young and not being tied down to say any like institutions or any roles um, where, where we, you know, where we have to, by virtue of the role compromise is we can say, no, we want, we want everything because, you know, we deserve it. It's not, we shouldn't have to pick and choose between different people's rights or, you know, just basic equality. We, we should get everything. And I don't think it's idealistic. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's impossible. I think that it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of time, but if enough young people fight for it, then we can get it. Absolutely. And Luz, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, like everyone said, like we're a force to be reckoned with. Uh, time and time again, our most powerful movements are led by young people. Um, we see it here in the panel and, and, and the changes that we've done in our own communities. So, you know, when you, when you think about that, like Sade said, uh, look at the people that have already made change and see how old they were, you know. Be, be real a lot of the, the a lot of the changes that we're seeing is because of young people and because of the initiatives that they've been putting out there in their own community to make change definitely and alexandria what are your thoughts on this yeah you know i agree with everything that's been said here and i think that it's so important for young people to be in the room because as i've said before we're going to be the ones most affected by the decisions made today and so also because we're really creative thinkers when it comes to issues as well. And so, however, even going further than that, I think this issue is one of communication styles. So people from different generations have different expectations about how we're all supposed to communicate. And because that gets in the way, they think we're unqualified when what is occurring is that we just communicate in different ways. And so we use different narratives and references and even our vocabulary is different. And so older generations need to look past our generational differences and they need to give us a seat at the table that we really deserve. I think that's so important. Um, you all have been incredible. I could literally sit and talk to you all afternoon, um, but I think we have time for probably one more question um, and, and we'll do a group one again because I want to make sure that for everybody watching at home or watching this back later we end on the note of you all and your work and kind of looking forward to what the future of activism the future of organizing for young people looks like um, and so to close I want to ask 
if there's anything you wish that we were talking about more when it comes to youth activism, your own work, kind of any last words that you want to close us off with. Um, so Sade, we'll stay with our pattern and we'll go to you first. I would say, you know, the first thing, there's a couple of things. The first thing is that there are Black organizers who are doing incredible work that aren't getting the recognition that they deserve because people are racist and they want to raise our efforts. Um, I remember when Vanessa Nak Nakate, who is a Ugandan climate um, activist, took a photo with Greta Thunberg and a couple of other climate activists and the Associated Press cropped her out and, you know, like, as if she wasn't even there and, you know, they it just, and so it was literally just like four white girls in the photo. And that is erasure on so many levels, like not just the physical, like you just crop someone out who was there, it's disrespectful, but also you're erasing um, black people from the environmental um, conversation with climate change. You're erasing in particular, not just black people, but also African people. So it was just particularly like so anti-black. So that's the first thing, you know, that we're, we're here, we're, we're disproportionately affected by a lot of the issues that are happening and you just can't erase us. Um, and so I really want people to understand that our efforts um, should not and cannot be erased. Um, and I think on that note, talking about Black Lives Matter activists, you know, I see so many um, white people and non-Black POC get like these brand endorsements and um, partner with companies and all these followers on Instagram and it's great. I'm not knocking that down, but I also want people to understand that that's not what defines you know, activism, because there are so many Black Lives Matter activists, especially in Ferguson, who do not see brand deals, they do not get to work with companies, they do not get the Instagram followers. Instead, they're called terrorists and they're called thugs. And, you know, they're risking their lives. They're put on FBI watch lists. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people, are like, really, some of them ha have been have been dead because of the work that they're doing. And so I want, I want people to understand that, you know, one, like, don't erase us. Two, that the things that come with activism aren't defining our activism. That's not what we're doing activism for, but I also want people to understand that there is a disparity even within activism. Like there are black organizers who are um, risking their lives for doing real authentic work and it's not deemed authentic or it's not deemed real or it's not deemed you know, important because it's, it's radical or it's progressive or because we're fighting for black lives. And, and when we look at who value, values black lives, this country doesn't. So. I, I really want people to understand that like, Black organizers and, act and activists are really at the forefront of so many movements. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Samir, we'll go to you for any final thoughts you have. Yeah, first of all, yeah, I definitely want to uh, fully agree with, uh, with all of that. I think that's so important to recognize, you know, where the, where, um, the silences are. And, and if they're truly silences or if they're just erasures, because a lot of times, when you don't see something, it's because that's been done on purpose. Um, specifically talking about LGBTQ plus uh, activism, youth activism, I wanna say, uh, first of all, that it's, it's definitely a privilege. You know, I recognize it's definitely a privilege to be able to um, be, a, be an activist uh, in this space because, you know, to be so public about who I am, to be out and to be able to, you know, face whatever, whatever comes at me, you know, it is a privilege because I have all these other support systems that I'm lucky enough to do that. So speaking to, you know, LGBTQ plus youth out there, you don't, you don't have to put yourself in that position. It was a huge burden on me. And while it, you know, has been also incredibly empowering, I don't want, you know, people to feel like they, they need to take that burden on when they're already struggling with so much. Uh, that being said, I also want to say that, you know, activism, it's not necessarily just this like huge big thing. You, you know, all of us have done a lot of like, you know, really big work, but it doesn't always start out that big. And so it's, sometimes it's hard to, to see or to understand where people start and, and how, you know, how these movements are not, you know, one or two people doing really big things. It's a lot of people doing a lot of really small things that together become really big. And so, you know, you as, as one, you know, young person can make a huge difference in someone's life just by you know helping them come out, just by um, making them feel safe and accepted, and you know just making sure that you are um, you know accepting. You you make it clear that if you know someone were to come to you with whatever they're struggling with, that you would you know you wouldn't um, say something hurtful. You wouldn't you know turn them away. You would be there for them. 
It means, you know, just calling out a hurtful remark when you see it. You know, if someone says something racist or homophobic or sexist, you need, you call that out. Um, it, it's, it's really these small things that can make a huge difference. You don't need to, you know, go change the world, you know, in one go. It's these small little steps that, you know, all put together change the world. And so that's, I think, what activism really is all about, is like, it's all these people coming together to make a difference. Thank you so much for that. And Luce, tell us where, where your head is at on this. Yeah, I definitely agree with all of you guys. Like, um, you know, the intersectional work that we do and how powerful um, our community is as young people and as, as folks like pushing forth progressive ideas out into the, into the world. Um, you know, we have the power to make things happen and we see it firsthand. And when we're asking for solutions like abolishing ICE and passing a Green New Deal and, you know, equity and uh, for all LGBTQ folks and, you know, more representation of, of Black organizers and, and their work and contributing to what, what we're, we're seeing now, right? It's, it's because we're asking for necessity and because it comes from our lived experiences, like, was, like it was said before, and our ability to show up for one another in our communities, right? And, you know, I, I want to leave it, leave it off to like knowing that, you know, if there's something in your community that's not right, like what steps and in, in, in how you're getting involved and how you're advocating for your own community is, 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 is what, um, you know, really pushes you forth to, to lead that change. Even if it's just going to like one rally or sharing a petition or, sharing in, in a location for, for, for an action, right? Um, you know, those small steps make you become a leader in your own community. Absolutely, thank you for that. And in closing, Alexandria, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I echo everything that everyone has said. And just to add on, you know, I think that people need to know that youth movements are the fastest growing and largest movements that we have. And so this means that we need older generations to support us. And so we need people to amplify our work, our efforts, and even more importantly, the older generations to fund our efforts and our movements. So the work that young people do is urgent and transformative. We make the most change, but it's not for free. And so there are real expenses for our work that many organizers shoulder themselves, but they shouldn't have to. And so I also believe that organizers should be compensated for their work because working for free is a privilege that many people don't have. And so therefore, in order for a movement to be truly intersectional, the people doing the work have to be paid for it. Thank you for that. And as we reach the closing of our panel today, I first and foremost want to say thank you to the four of you for making time out of your very busy schedules to share so many incredible perspectives, necessary commentary and, and critical work with us. The world is truly better for it. And I'm just so honored to have gotten to have this conversation with you. Um, thank you to Mashable for bringing us all together for this conversation. And also in closing, thank you to everybody who is either watching with us live or will be watching this back later. Um, please continue, if you don't already, to support the incredible work that these young people are doing follow their work, amplify their voices, support these movements. Um, it's incredibly powerful, but also incredibly necessary. And just to reiterate, thank you so much for answering some questions today and spending your time with us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.